Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. My guest today is Sarah Hawley. She is the CEO and founder of Grow Motely. They are a platform for sourcing, growing, and leading remote teams. And as you might guess, they are a remote team themselves spread across the world. And she is leading them from the US, but is originally from Australia. And we get into that and talk about her reasons for moving to the US and what always attracted her there and some of the favorite aspects of living in the US, along with some of the challenges and tactical information that you might want to know if you're trying to relocate to the US. That was a lot of fun in this conversation for me, having been originally from America, but I really enjoyed getting into her opinions and thoughts on the whole future of work movement and how it relates to global mobility and democratizing opportunity across the world. We went in a bunch of different directions and just had a lot of fun diving into all the things that make us tick. So really appreciated her time. She's a wealth of knowledge as a published author, someone who's appeared on multiple TV channels and exited several companies in the uh, seven figures. I was pretty grateful that she took the time to come on About Abroad. So really enjoyed this one. I hope you will as well. Please help me in welcoming Sarah to About Abroad. Yeah, so I think it's a little early. There. It's my early afternoon here, kind of early there for you, but we're both sipping on a coffee. So I'm, I'm thinking we'll have a pretty good conversation here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 10 a.m. It's not too bad. Ah, okay. <laughs> but I do like to just start my mornings nice and slow. So you're the first thing for the morning. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get your week off to a good start here. I actually have literally have no idea. Where are you actually located? I'm in Austin, Texas. In the US. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, that does ring a bell. Literally one of my favorite cities in the US. One of the, It used to be a hidden gym. It's not so much anymore. Yeah, it's pretty great. I think everybody, so many people moved here in the last few years, including myself. So I was living in Colorado in the mountains, but at the start of 2020, ended up coming to Austin and it's been a good place to be the last couple of years, I will say. What brought you there from Colorado? Um, mostly, I met Joe, who's my husband now. We met like a week before the pandemic, and he had just bought a house in Austin. So I was already planning to be in Austin. It's a whole long story, but I was already planning to be in Austin for some work stuff, and we ended up going on a date, and things were good, and we decided to have a fun lockdown together, thinking that it was going to be two weeks, and you know, the rest is history. So it was kind of a, a one of those COVID romances that, yeah. It was, it was amazing. I kept my house in Colorado up until May and we would go backwards and forwards, which was also really nice during the pandemic when we weren't leaving the country, but we were able to go. We have a van as well. We have a camper now. We have a baby. But we had a van, so we would travel around the country. I had been to Austin a couple of times in 2019. Also just had this feeling when I was there that I would be spending more time here. So yeah, it's not surprising that I ended up moving here. What is it about Austin? Because like I think people from the outside, there's a very big percentage of the audience that is not from the US, um, that's listening from different corners of the world. And when they think of the US, they think of, you know, okay, I'm going to hit New York and Vegas and LA. I got to get a picture in front of the Hollywood sign. Maybe some people will say like, oh, you know, Yellowstone or Yosemite. But I still feel like Austin flies under the radar. Yet I think a lot of Americans that like myself, like we know it's one of those just super cool spots. We want people to see more of those places when they come to the US. What is it about there for, for some Someone listening hasn't experienced it. Well, I think that's a really interesting point. Like as a non-US, I'm Australian, if, if you haven't guessed. But yeah, when I used to think of the US, I also only thought of like LA and New York and kind of what we see in the movies and things like that. Yeah, Austin's just one of those places. I mean, there's a lot more to this country than those cities. And Austin is one of those additional gems. But I love it here. 
mostly for the people, to be honest. So, I mean, Austin's a pretty city. There's a good music scene and a bar scene, which I'm sort of like not even that into at this point in my life. I'm more like I have an 18-month-old baby and really into like more living communally and living with people and being in nature. So, one of the challenges that I have right now is like being a little bit more living in more high density after living in the mountains of Colorado for a number of years. But I have a very solid community here. So, I just have really, really amazing people that all kind of happened to move here during 2020. So that's one of the main reasons I'm here, if not the main reason I'm here. Um, There is a good tech scene and entrepreneurial sort of startup scene, which is really nice as well. And that's a a big advantage. But I think a lot of it is the people and there's a quirky nature to Austin that's fun, you know, quirky architecture and what's the keep Austin weird or something is the the (laughs) saying. So (laughs) it is a a weird place and it's definitely different to the rest of Texas. So, you know, if you told me, 10 years ago that one day I'd end up living in Texas, I'd be like, what? I just couldn't imagine it. I don't know why. I just thought of Texas as like cowboys and all sorts of things. But yeah, there's there's definitely a heart and soul here in Austin. Yeah, it's its own little blue bubble in the middle of this giant mm-hmm. vast redness. And I, I think like it's, Texas is one of those places that foreigners know of. Like I'm in, I've been living in Europe for the last handful of years. And I would say like a pretty high percentage of the time when someone says, oh, are you from the US? Like, are you from Texas? <laughs> and it's just like one of those states that they know and everybody's got a stereotype about. But Austin is kind of like the antithesis of that of that stereotype in a lot of ways, which is really interesting in and of itself, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not particularly like attached or I don't really think about the American political system that much in terms of any kind of affiliation or whatever, but it's definitely what they describe it as the blueberry and the tomato soup or something like that. But it took me a long time to even figure out which side was red and which side was blue. So I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's an interesting thing, right? As a foreigner living, like when you're really living there, you've been there for a, a number of years. You, it is still hard sometimes. I guess some people really enjoy it, but I'm not one of them. And it sounds like you're not either. Like I don't really enjoy getting like deep into the politics of a place. And it's sometimes mm-hmm. you can, it's kind of nice. You can sort of insulate yourself from it in a, in a way. Yeah. It's something kind of fascinating. A visitor there in some way, something, in, yeah. at least for me, something in my head kind of allows me to disassociate from it. And there's a lot of peace in, in that, <laughs> I find. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's kind of fascinating when you leave your country of birth and start living more globally. Well, the way the political systems work in most countries is you have to be a citizen to cast a vote or what have you. You kind of are just on the outside of it. And and you don't have the same, or anyway, my experience is I, did, I don't have the same, I didn't grow up with the American political system. So I don't like have the same affinities or stories or attachments or whatever that the people here do. And you're just observing it. And it's quite fascinating, really. And that would be for any country I go live in besides Australia, in which I do have some of those stories and ideas, you know, were part of my upbringing. But it's pretty cool to get outside of it and sometimes just watch it and be like, wow, what a weird <laughs> it's like a really weird thing. <laughs> it's a weird thing that a bunch of people are doing. <laughs> it is a weird thing that we are just doing. That is uh, for sure. I love like in the book Sapiens, he talks about how this, the whole, all the, all these things that we've made up is humanity. Like mm-hmm. they're all just myths and like the political it's system. It's so powerful. Just, yeah. yeah. That book and just really unwinding everything and realizing like we made all of it up and like we can make new things up we can choose not to do them anymore. Like it's really crazy. And I do think over the last couple of years, I've really kind of looked a lot more objectively at many of our systems. You know, I think we're reaching a point where those systems that were made up a couple of hundred years ago, different you know, different systems, slightly different timeframes, but they're not really working for us right now for for where we're at. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I think when you do live more globally, you start to see that it's a lot more easy to see that all the stuff is made up when you've lived in a bunch of different countries, because you're like, oh, they made it up this way over here. Oh, over here, they made it up that way. Like, you know, they're just stories. We just created them, their systems, their structures, their ideas, just like our companies are all just ideas and things that we make up. And I think engaging it with that way can be quite 
quite powerful as well because it does remind us that we can create new ways of being and we can do things differently also. Yeah, it's very liberating in a lot of ways. And and I think my, it does open you, your eyes up a little bit to saying, you know, we can create a better mousetrap. You and I have connected in the past at this kind of crossroads of the what they call the future of work. And then we're also both expats from our previous countries living in different countries now and on different sides of the Atlantic still. You know, we obviously see eye to eye on that already. Like it doesn't have to be this status quo march to the same drum beat throughout your whole life, the, the way that we kind of think that we do. And I don't know, it's, it's a very interesting time. We're in this, it's a time period that's changing very quickly. And a lot of things along with that are changing very rapidly around the way we work, around the way we think, this whole idea around global mobility and where you can call home or where you can earn an income from. I mean, you're you're right at the, the crossroads of that yourself. So it's an exciting time and it's also really interesting. And sometimes it's fun to step back and just kind of watch it. Yeah, totally. And I think to watch like the reasons why we think that we can't do things, you know, like every country has borders and a military. And if you start talking about like, we don't really need that. Like if there was none of it, then what would the world look like? But then we have all these stories that, well, if we don't have it, like everyone's going to invade this country. And like every country kind of has the same story and believes the same thing. And I mean, it's a wild, crazy time. Like I don't know what it looks like if we just decided from tomorrow on we would have no more military and open all the borders. Like I'm not necessarily saying that that is the way to do it, but we are definitely rethinking things and it's a time and an opportunity to start moving toward change that's more creating systems and structures that are more serving of who we are now as humanity and the challenges that we face. And But it's hard, like change is hard, you know, change is difficult for people and for society. And I have to remember that as well when I think about this stuff is remembering that I'm thinking about it from the perspective of someone who's lived in, you know, half a dozen countries, traveled to over 60, lived pretty globally since I was 18 years of age. I'm looking through a really different lens than someone who's grown up in I don't know, Idaho and not not left really. Like that's a really different lens to be looking at life through and and replace Idaho with really anywhere in the world. If you've just been there primarily, it's really hard to kind of see the shifts and changes as something that could be positive or possible. Yeah, I find myself having a lot of empathy for those people as well. Like I, I meet people, it sounds like you have too, like you meet people along the way who haven't left their home city, country, whatever. They have very little perspective on the world and they're very ingrained in their thoughts. And, and it, that also goes for the whole like future of work conversation too. You know, like you meet people who are just like, no, like mm-hmm. we're not going to this remote model. Like that doesn't, this is the way we've always done things. And you got to have some empathy for for those people who on both sides of the coin who haven't had that experience yet and don't yeah. have any other perspective to offer. Exactly. And like there is no right or wrong, but I think there is the only thing that's certain is that like we're constantly evolving and shifting whether it's, you know, ourselves as an individual, this whole entire universe. Like everything is constantly in motion and so to some degree like change is certain and it's going to happen. Um, and I think things get pulled in a direction based on the desires of people of a movement. They can also get pulled in a direction by control and force as well. But as it pertains to work, I mean, it feels like there's a groundswell and a pull toward moving to a more remote type model where people can be wherever they want to be and still work. But you know, there's still a lot of holding on. <laughs> it's scary <Yeah. laughs> for people. Um, against against all odds and all the data that says otherwise, there are still a lot of people holding on. Was this something you were really passionate about? about before the pandemic? Like you you mentioned the, all the travel and kind of living globally. I guess I'm curious, like what led you into Grow Motely? And I, mean, I don't know, we can go as far back with that as you want. I'll leave it very broad, but I'm just kind of curious how those dots connect, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll give the quick story, but I... Like I said, I've been pretty globally minded since I was about 18. I I went and lived in Europe. I went and lived in England and then did it like Europe trip when I was 18 and it just changed my whole life, changed my world. I realized like, holy shit, there is so much out there. There's so much for me to do and see and be and experience. And that was kind of the lens through which I then started creating my life moving forward. So there was always a lot of travel and desire to live, kind of have another experience living in another place as I got older and became more resourced and more experienced of how to navigate all of 
this stuff, it became very clear that this was the life that I wanted was I didn't want to just go on a little trip and then come back to Australia and live out my days there. Like I wanted this life of adventure and travel and living in different parts of the world throughout my life. It wasn't something I was just wanting to get out of my system. So in 2014, I'd been an entrepreneur for about four-ish years and I was just starting to feel like this is trapping me. Like it's weighing me down from what I really want, which is to travel and be living in other parts of the world. But I have this office and all of these people and you know I'm trying to get in there really early and I care about my company. I love my work that I do, but it's starting to feel like a burden because it's negating this other part of my life that's really important. And so I turned all of my companies remote, which was really weird thing to do back then, especially in, I was in financial planning. So professional services where people came into your office and sat across the table for you and had the tea and coffee and all of that kind of thing. But I just decided like, I don't even know. It's so weird to think about it now, really, because I think I've always done things that were a little bit out there and a bit different. And I always find it fascinating to look back and be like, wow, who who were you that you like thought that that would be a cool thing to do at that time? Um, I didn't know anyone else that was doing it, but I just decided to do it. And as soon as I started like operating remotely within our team, I realized like I can hire people anywhere and started building this global team, which just felt like it was like a very, that happened pretty much straight away and felt like the next evolution of like, oh yeah, of course. Well, if we're working remotely, we don't just have to be, you know, a bunch of people from Melbourne, Australia. We can be people from anywhere. And that was very fulfilling for my soul because I love, that's what I love about travel is just meeting and interacting with people. And, you know, honestly, working remotely has been even more powerful than a lot of the travel that I've done because I really get to know these people and I really get to know their lives and what happens on a day to day. And I'm really integrating with that aspect, all these different aspects of global culture. And then, yeah, was able to move to the US after doing that, which was one of the things that I wanted to do and definitely something I was into before the pandemic. And I was actually working on Grow Remotely before the pandemic, only just like end of 2019, I kind of started working on it and when the pandemic happened, it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like this just happened. But it's really crazy to think of now because I don't even know, like I was deluded before the pandemic <laughs> to think that people would be ready for what Grimoli is, you know, like quite frankly, there's still a lot of resistance out there to com- for companies to work truly globally. Like remote work is one hurdle that we've overcome. And I think there's a lot less resistance to that now, but to actually build a global team, like that's, you know, people are still not there yet. That's going to take time. And I'm only realizing that now because like I said, I've been doing it since 2014. So I, it's like that thing where you just can't see what you can't see because it's so normal. It's so normal for me. But I think, oh my goodness, if the pandemic didn't happen, like, I don't know, people were not ready at all. <laughs> I love that. So, like that looking in the rearview mirror, like the, that reflection and say, man, that was really audacious of me to even think that I could do this. <laughs> like, like, what the hell was yeah, I thinking? We, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're having this conversation at Doist a little bit also because we built Twist, which was like, we we had like a 10-year plan with Twist. Like, we didn't expect it to be something that would catch on. Like, it was way, way too early adoptery because it was just too far out there. But kind of like you, like, we'd been doing remote work a long time and we thought eventually people will start kind of working the way we are. Maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> we'll see. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and like we launch it and then, you know, you're like a couple years later, the pandemic hits and like you have that hockey stick moment where like everything goes crazy. And, yeah. and it, it's just it's just kind of funny because you, you think like in retrospect, I look back and like, were we really going to wait like 10 years? <laughs> 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 or were we really prepared for that? Like, I don't know. But we have to be in a way like I think of that, like sometimes with remotely, it's like oh, the perfect time. It's amazing. And also, like I said, there is still this barrier where companies are not like the average everyday company are not out there being like, yeah, let's hire people from all over the world. So we still have like some hurdles there to just like educate people and help them understand and see what's possible. So there still is like a longer time frame on the things that we're doing. But I think we have to people like us and companies like ours building things for the future because it's showing the way and what's possible. And yeah, it's not always easy in those early stages, but it's exciting. And it's looking at it like from like knowing that you guys built Twist and I was thinking, about remotely and all of that it's like it was happening like there were signs right like collectively there was this like movement and momentum towards something and then we have these giant leaps forward I think that happened yeah I mean as far as I'm pretty sure I'm looking but I'm going back a little bit but I'm pretty sure like you and I were already connected even if not like you know we hadn't been on a call together or something we had we were in running there were some circles happening where you saw Mm -hmm. companies products services emerging 
yeah. to serve remote teams and embrace global mobility and things like this. But we just didn't know what it was going to be so fast. Well, no, I was just going to say, like, it was, it's crazy because I think there were times when I really felt crazy. I really felt like I was such a weirdo with the things. And there was just a few people like us, like that we were all connected, connected and be like, okay, like there's a few other crazy people out there doing this thing. And then now a lot of this stuff has become normal. Like I used to be afraid to say things like, what if we had no borders and no military? Like I would only say that to my friends. I wouldn't go on a podcast and say it because I think people must think she's actually insane. But now like some of these conversations are at least like just more like, let's just throw it around. Let's just see what might be like, let's, let's open it up. It's done that for a lot of things too. Like, I think this is a subject you're passionate about as well, but like for <laughs> DNI, I mean, I feel like it's, it's helped push uh, diversity along. And I mean, the way we look at things, we're just looking at things through a different lens. Like you don't, you don't have to hire right within your own postal code anymore. So, I mean, just by default, you just get outside of your, your little wheelhouse that you're used to living in. And then all of a sudden, when you go from there to global, things change rapidly. <laughs> and rapidly. So it's fascinating. This is another thing that I would have felt crazy saying, but I think like remote work and you know, remotely as a company and, and other companies that are enabling this stuff is like literally a path to world peace. It sounds like wild, but if we're all working together and connecting with each other every single day from all over the globe, all of a sudden we realize like we are all the same. We're all just human beings on this earth and we all want the same things. We just want to be seen, heard, loved, valued. We want to know that our life means something and matters. Literally, it doesn't matter how culturally different we are, what our religion might be or what our societal norms are. Like at our core, we want to know that we are enough, that we matter you know, that we exist, that we're seen and heard. And when we break all of that down and connect at that level, the ideas of all these like countries and borders and military and fighting each other and whatever start to dissolve because we are just living on a shared planet. We can't pretend anymore that we're not. It's not over there. Do whatever you want, you know, rape and pillage the earth over there so that we can have some convenience over here. Like, it catches up. It's going to come over here if we don't stop doing that. And also like there are people living there. Should we think about that? And animals and, you know, it's all, it's all connected. It's all one, but we could easily not see that when travel was harder to do and travel bridged a lot of gaps. I think like in our lifetime, we've traveled a lot more than our parents, for example, and then their parents again. And that started to like bridge these gaps and, and change things, but now working globally and working in this way, like there's going to be a huge impact, I think, on how we interrelate with each other um, and breaking down all of the racism and bigotry that has existed in our history and our past that is all stemming from this system of otherness and protection of what we have and making sure they're the villains and they're the demons over there that can't come and get our, our stuff. There's only one planet. It's, it's everybody's stuff. <laughs> back back to, the, to the myths thing, right? Like all, all those things are, are those myths that he's talking about. And I mean, something you just said really resonates with me, like the, the path to world peace. Like someone might chuckle at that and just think like, that's very hyperbole. But no, I mean, I, I actually know exactly what you mean. I have a real life living example that's happening in my life right now. I know for a fact that if I was watching the what's happening with Russia and Ukraine right now, like 15 years ago, I would be saying or thinking or hearing very different things about like, quote unquote, like those Russians, right? Like you'd be grouping them all together as this one like entity, right? And so on the flip side, like where I'm at today, I work with people that live on both sides of those borders. And I hear the pain, like we have, you know, pretty intense conversations about this, like what they're going through on both sides, like not just people in, in Ukraine, but people in Russia and, and the, the real life trauma that they're going through. And like, it's just so humanizing. It's just like all of a sudden we're just all this one group of humans that are happen to be stuck on some side of some imaginary line and are getting screwed by it. And so anyway, it just totally changes your perspective. You, you see this giant group of people in a totally different way. And this might be the first time in history where we've really done that, where you've walked side by side of your friends. You haven't met a friend who tells you about the war from 20 years ago and what it was like, and you have some connection and empathy. This is like, literally, this is happening right now. Like my team in Romania were like hosting refugees in their homes. And, you know, I also work with people and have friends in Ukraine and Russia. Like I reached out to this woman who I'd bought a sweater from on Etsy, which was so random. And we chatted a couple of times because we had some issues with the postage. And so when it happened, I just like, okay, I'll message her and see how she's doing. I don't know this one. I just bought something from her, but I was like, how are you? And she was like, I can't 
she was crying. Like, I can't believe you would ask. The whole world hates us. I'm on the border. I'm hosting refugees from Ukraine as well in my home. And like that, be, seeing like my other friend's video footage in Ukraine of what was happening, him, his life, this person that a week earlier I was having a business meeting with about doing something between our companies and now he's like run, running for his life and talking with this woman and having my team hosting refugees in their homes. It's like way freaking different. Like this is not – and that's very different to what they're showing on the news but now I'm actually plugged in and connected to the reality. And that also helps me see like this political thing to go back to where we very first started this conversation. Like it's a few people who are deciding to do things like this. And it's millions of people who have no desire to do that. They don't want to invade another country or be invaded or fight off. Like the average person is not desiring to do that. Yet, like you said, if that happened 15 years ago, we would lump them all in and say, well, all the Russians wanted to do that to all the Ukrainians. And like, that's just how it is. And Totally. You, you talked about your, like the Euro trip that you took that changed your life in a lot of ways. So I share that with you. I had like a European study abroad kind of experience that was just like, oh, like my eyes are open to the world in a different way. And but it was at the time, like uh, that, right after a couple years after 9 11, US is in Afghanistan. And I was totally lumped into that group of like so often just being like that, like dirty, ugly American. <laughs> and like I even end up actually one time, like walking through Vienna, walk, accidentally wandered into like an anti American protest and was just like, I'm definitely going to get killed. Like somebody's going to, there's a big like red American flag just like hanging over my head for sure. Like everybody can smell me or something. And, uh, and so, anyway, Anyway, like I have witnessed some of that and it's just a different age. Like it just totally is different. I mean, where people from around the world are getting the chance to meet and see people for who they really are. And I love that. It's it's one of the things that sounds like you had this as well. Like I really wanted to work in that environment. I like specifically sought out. I want to be surrounded by people from other places, hear different accents, having a random over lunch conversation. Just, oh, really? Like, what do you do in Bangladesh? Like, what's a day like in Bangladesh? You know, like I want to have those conversations. And it's so cool that this is becoming a real reality now for, for people across the world. When did you first do it? Like, what was it like for you when you first sought out that remote job that was going to be working with global, with, yeah, with a global team, not just remote, but global? So I, yeah, that's an awesome distinction because I've always worked remotely about halfway through my careers when I like, uh, let's say I'm like 13, 14 years into my career now. So about halfway through, I was like, I really need to have more of, I'm working remotely, but I'm in the US. I'm surrounded by, you know, people who look and sound a lot like me. And I'm just craving that travel experience just on a day to day basis. Like I've jokingly said, like, I want the mundane to become not mundane. I want, I want the day to day to be exciting and fun. And that's what would add some spice to it. So that's when I. I sought that out like about seven years ago. That's when I found Duist. And it was mind blowing to me at the time. Like I was, I was just giddy, just, you know, working for a Danish boss and collaborating with a guy in the Czech Republic and Argentina on the same call and hearing the different accents. I was just a total nerd for it, like complete nerd. <laughs> it's really about the same time frame then for like me and you, like both of us doing that thing. And it is weird to look back, isn't it? To think, oh, wow, that was really freaking out there back then. The fact that it's still a challenge, like, you know, there's all these companies that are remote now, but they like still have to overcome this hurdle of what it might be like to work with someone from another part of the world. But it's so amazing. It's so incredible and so magical. And it's going to bring, you know, I mean, it's brings so much richness to my life and I can hear the richness it brings to yours and what I'm sure we're contributing now, you know, by being a part of that as well. This is like on the table and on offer for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. right there. It's, <laughs> it's so much more accessible. And I've had people actually ask me like, does that upset you? Like, you know, you you had to like, like one of the things that really pushes me in the whole future of work discussion is that I did have to make a lot of sacrifices, like to have remote work and to obtain, you know, location independence and to work for a global startup, like that came with salary cuts and taking less prestigious jobs and moving to less prestigious places, perhaps, you know, all whatever, all these things. And so like it did, you know, it did come with some steps backwards, I guess. And I, so I've had people ask me like, do you, does that upset you? Like it's, it's like, they don't know how good they have it, old man kind of thing. <laughs> and, but it genuinely does not like I'm, I'm one of the things that I, on the other hand, like to the contrary, I would say one of the things that really motivates me is just, I want to make this whole thing so accessible in any little way that I can. And so that's, that's what motivates me. Yeah. It's very clear in your work. That's a, that's a big why for you. 
Oh, yeah. Like, that's really all I care about. It's It feels like, you know, because I had that first trip when I was 18 and experienced travel and then my life kind of became, I, I was building my life around this ability to live more as a globally minded human and have all these experiences. And, and you know, now I've found myself in this line of work and doing everything I do, but it, it feels very like divine, but very important to me. Like, this is my life's work because it is important for all of us. One of the things that comes up for me is, just that remembering that like we chose it. So our impetus of going into it and which would have also expected our experience was very different from everyone now who's like been thrust into it and they're trying to figure it out. I only connected these dots more recently as well as like, I didn't find it so difficult in a lot of ways because I was very invested in it. I wanted it to work. I, and you know, our minds are so powerful, like what we believe becomes our reality. And so when we really want something, we construct, you know, the stories around ourselves to kind of support the thing that we want to get to, even though there was challenges and it was weird and people thought I was weird and I had to kind of live through all of that like maybe you did and some of the sacrifices and things were there there was this real kind of desire for it and I realized that that's something is important for us to like help people and take them on a journey because they didn't necessarily choose it the way we did they got thrust into it and now they're trying to figure it out and there's a lot of aspects of like hey I see this is positive but it's still I was like I woke up one day and had to do it I didn't like set a goal and set out to do it so it's like realizing the difference there as well but that's the my numerology is a number one. I'd be curious what you are, but that's like the path of a pioneer. So this is my life. I'm always out doing shit that nobody else understands and it can feel kind of alone at times, but there's a greater meaning to it. I used to have a coach in high school that would say, uh, it's lonely at the top. Like, you know, like when you're out in front, it's lonely, but you, you know, you got to be the one like push, somebody's got to be the one out front pushing it forward. Yeah. I find that, I find that really interesting. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by my good friends over at Greenback Tax. As an American citizen, I'm from one of only two countries in the entire world that requires I pay taxes on my global income, regardless of which country I'm actually living in. So when I started my expat journey back in 2015, I knew my tax situation was about to get complicated. Fortunately, I discovered Greenback and I've never looked back. Greenback is 100% focused on helping U.S. expats with their tax situation. And to date, they've filed almost 50,000 returns for nearly 15,000 happy customers from more than 200 different countries. After seven years working together, I can say with confidence that they make one of the most painful parts of life abroad an absolute breeze with their automated systems, friendly advisors, and expertise in the very specific niche of U.S. expat taxes. Also, for those of you who may have fallen behind on your taxes and or you're trying to get ahead of tax season in 2023, Greenback has your back here as well. They can assist with late filings to ensure you don't encounter any problems with the IRS and to make sure you start 2023 off right. Tax season is on the horizon. Learn more about Greenback today by going to greenbacktaxservices.com via the link in the show notes. Hey guys, if you're still around and enjoying this episode, then I think you might actually like our once a month newsletter as well. If you'd like to sign up, just open up the show notes of the episodes you're currently listening to, scroll down and look for aboutabroad.com slash newsletter. It takes about 30 seconds to sign up. It's a fantastic way to support the show. And I think you'll be pleased with the information that we provide every month as well. Thanks a lot for listening. Hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Something else you're talking about there that I think is I would love to get your opinion on is related to that. I hear a lot about Gen Z hating this remote work thing in some ways. And, you know, like I saw somebody mentioned we were kind of robbed of our college experience because of the pandemic. And now we're thrown into remote work and we're having to, you know, sit at home and isolate. And and I think from my vantage point now, I think like, man, and, you know, don't overthink what the office experience was. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't always that great, I promise you. But I, I do get that also. Like, you know, you're 21, 22, 23, and you're coming out, you're trying to figure out how to move your career forward and you want to socialize. And I, I was able to do a lot of that early in my career. I crave it a lot less now. So anyway, I don't know, like what's been your experience with this? I don't know how, like what your, the talent within the company looks like and, but, but you're in this world sort of, so I'd be curious to get your opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that in Remotely, we've for the most part also attracted people who are really desiring this remote work just because of the nature of who the company is and the message we put out there. We, we attract people who are really passionate. But I have, is it Danielle Farage? I think I've re- recently re- met with her and she was doing a podcast or something about this and she's Gen Z. So I've recently been like think pondering this and thinking about it. And I think a lot of the same things as you, like don't glamorize this office. It really wasn't that glamorous <laughs> but I do understand I do remember being like at the end of my school and study years and being excited about like getting wearing like I don't know some kind of freaking costume essentially I think of it now but wearing like my work clothes and my high heels and traipsing through the city to go to my office and I'm not going to say like part of that wasn't fun for a minute but the reality is like you can have that experience and I would encourage people to create it by co-working spaces or whatever it might be like where you choose to live like you just have a lot more freedom and flexibility and and choice now of what to do but if that feels good for you to like go somewhere every day and wear something and and meet people like co-working spaces are great for that and I know it is different so I have some empathy but I really the bigger picture for me is like I don't think it was very serving of humanity to be like everybody has to go to, to this place at this time every day and sit in this air conditioned room all day long with unnatural light and like do that for 40, 50 years. Like I just don't really think that that was serving of humanity in general. So it's a shift, it's a change. And I guess I'm quite like the spiritual aspect of me that connects with just everything just is and we're just having an experience like that's the experience that was had over the last couple of years and that's the experience that was had for people of that age and it's not like we don't have to label it as good or bad or say oh my god my poor kids they missed out on their college uh, their college graduation or, or what have you like I mean it's true and it's a bummer and it is just is and so like what else like what is next and I think this is something that we have such a hard time with as humans is like what's right and wrong what's good and bad versus just like it just is what it is and like the more that we can just accept it and look for what are the lessons for me like where's the gold what is the silver lining in this what how is this happening for me rather than to me that's not to take away from the fact that when you're in the experience it's hard so I do I do have compassion I think that building relationships like Gen Z should also give themselves credit for their ability to build relationships online that did not exist 20, 30 years ago. Like people who were graduating from college 20, 30 years ago did not have the same skill and ability to network and build relationships online because social media didn't exist. So like it's a whole different world and saying like that we missed out on something that somebody had 20 years ago in the construct of society then, it's like totally different now anyway. They didn't have some of the advantages that you have now where you can access anyone, anywhere, probably if you hustle enough on social media and sometimes you don't even need to, but like people are so accessible and creating connections and networking that way was never possible before you had to try to get through a receptionist on a phone line. <laughs> yeah, we both grew up in the... Uh, it was another parallel with you and I have that, that hasn't come up yet, oddly enough. Uh, and there are a couple actually that I hope we'll get a chance to get to. But we both grew up in like the financial services area. So I also started my career in this space and studied that in university. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, yeah. And also wore the, <laughs> the costume that you called it. I mean, I'm, I'm laughing through all these things because I'm going like... Yeah, you know, it wasn't that glamorous, like trying to get through to the receptionist at uh, at so and so from your cube. And uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to like always have worked remotely, but I, I still had to do some of those things, a lot of those things. And so, anyway, I just I found it funny. It, it's interesting to hear your perspective. Once again, I'm kind of glad that I'm not crazy. You know, you mentioned that earlier. I'm, I'm glad that I'm not over here thinking thinking something crazy. We're we're aligned on that. I think I think back to some of the networking. Then I just want to add really quickly is like there were people that I knew, that I spent significant time with at conferences and professional development days and events. And I swear to God, I knew nothing about them. I look back now, I'm like, don't know if they were married or not. Don't know if they had kids. Don't know if they had a dog or a cat. Don't know where they like to go on vacation. I didn't know anything. 
all I knew was their professional self that would show up at these events and conferences. And I'm like, that is really different as well. So to have that experience, you also had to like hide a big part of yourself. You just, you had this professional persona that would show up and interact with all these other professional personas. And, you know, it wasn't all it's cracked up to be really. It's a lot nicer now to really get to know people, which is ironic that we do it at a distance more effectively than we ever did in person. I don't even know what that's about. <laughs> I, I also find this fascinating. There's almost a di- there's a different layer of depth to it. Being able to to do it from a distance, and I will like I will also admit like I'm I'm a pretty like extroverted person. I actually enjoyed a lot of those aspects of like like the social aspects of being in an office and stuff. I wasn't there normally. I would travel to there occasionally for like quarterly meetings or something like that. But like I actually enjoyed all that stuff. And I was a bit skeptical when I moved to the fully like location independent, like I'm working on a global team. I'm not going to see these people almost never. We do very few meetings, like even like virtually. I was a bit skeptical of like, well, my what's going to happen to me like socially? I'm, I'm going to shrivel up and die. I, I crave that stuff. But I, I have really enjoyed this different depth that comes with that. I mean, I mentioned earlier, like having having conversations with people who are on both sides of the border where there's a war happening like there's a different depth that comes with that and that's something I've really grown to appreciate and then let you know more superficially there's still a lot of depth there so yeah I don't I think this is something that flies a little bit under the radar and is probably taken for granted I was going to mention earlier another parallel that we haven't gotten to which I'm shocked because I was ready to pounce on it immediately when you uh when you mentioned this earlier but you're a camper vanner and and so am I but I've never done camper vanning in my home country so Oh that's funny <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never done it in my home country either, so there you go. <laughs> but your home country is a good place to do it. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like you're sort of in like a mecca of, of it's two different types of camper van. You know, like in the US, it's like wilderness and nature and, uh, and, and things like that. In Europe, it's so cool because you can drive around and like, you know, be, be in these like ancient cities and walking around, but also sleeping there. Two different types. But I, I miss, that's the biggest thing my wife and I miss living in Europe. It's not that there's not beautiful nature there's tons of it but like the thing in the u.s is like the big wide open spaces and the big national parks and things like that and so i don't know i think it'd be cool to to dive into your your uh, van life experience there the u.s especially because you're coming at it from the perspective of a of a foreigner yeah well yeah i love it so my husband and i have a truck camper now because we have a baby oh well he's 18 months old but prior to that, we had a Mercedes Sprinter. So yeah, we did the the van life and now it's the camper life. It's pretty much the same because a truck camper can park in any regular car parking spot, which is nice. And we spent eight weeks last summer or like the year, not this year, last year doing the Pacific Northwest, which was awesome. And during the pandemic, we would travel a lot in the van before Luca was born. We were like driving all over the country just whenever we felt like getting out, which was often because of the lockdowns and everything. So we would just go on adventures wherever we felt like going. And yeah, it's great. It's such a simple life. And I really enjoy, like I relate with what you're saying in the US, like the big wide open spaces and the big roads. And it's quite a nice country to drive around to do long road trips. Like, I don't know exactly what it is, but when I was in Australia, I didn't think the idea of driving somewhere that was 20 or 30 or 40 hours away would be anything I would want to do. But here it's like, oh, because there's so much to see in between and, and the roads are generally pretty good and big, wide open roads and open spaces and very humbling nature to see sometimes like the Grand Canyon or just big mountains, ranges, mountain ranges and things that just like take you your breath away. So yeah, it's fun. It's a good life. I've always been a bit of a hippie at heart, I think. And it's, it's always nice for me to get back to simplicity whenever I can. Something I enjoy about running a remote company, even though it sometimes does still running any kind of business sometimes feels complex at times, but there's also a simplicity of like, we don't have anything physical, you know, we're just like here all over the world, just hanging out, doing this thing together. We're not like worrying about booking the cleaners to come and tie, organize the office and all the stuff that goes with having like a physical space. Yeah, I, I definitely crave simplicity in my life. And any anytime I'm in the van or the camper and in nature, that's like what it grounds me back into. I think it's in one of my gene keys. I don't know if anyone's into the gene, gene keys, but that's they're amazing. So 
Making the complex simple is like one of my jinkies. <laughs> <laughs> one of those things for you. I love that. I, I totally, it totally resonates with me. I also need that escape to nature. The mountains are kind of that for me. Living in Spain the last few years, the Pyrenees have been that that place. Have you spent any time on the uh, like over on the east coast, up in like the Appalachian Mountains um, in this space? Not really. No. Yeah, not like a lot of time. No, I've been uh, okay. through some of those areas, but no. I was just curious. That's kind of where I'm from. And it's a, it's a beautiful, but what they say, some people say it's like what they have one of the most beautiful drives or the number one be- most beautiful drive through the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is pretty amazing. And I would love to do some van life up in there someday, but yeah. that's kind of my backyard. So when you make your way over there at, at any point, it's only like a 30 hour drive. It's nothing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me know. Cause uh, yeah, I know that area well. Oh, I love it. Yeah. We're going through the in-between stage with Luca. 18 month olds don't really love being in the car for <laughs> too long. So we're keeping the trips a little bit shorter. When he was a little baby, like I said, we did eight weeks in the camper last summer, but uh, we're in an in-between. I think we'll we'll get back into it in a couple of, a year or two or something, but he doesn't quite understand why we would want to sit in the car for eight hours right now. <laughs> yeah, I could, uh, I could imagine. You guys are troopers for, for having done it uh, yeah. even, even then. So probably inspiring somebody with that story right now and and you didn't even realize it. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll keep traveling for sure. I love it. Uh, this is kind of a two-part question, but I've been curious about both. So you mentioned earlier that coming to... You said something like coming to the US was a thing you always wanted to do. Is that true? Or is that, was that like accurately understood? And if so, could you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, I think since I really first came here, I just had a resonance with the US. And I think I went to Hawaii when I was like 10. I don't know that I wouldn't say that was my residence, but when I first came here, I would have been to the US, the main mainland or whatever. You, I don't know what do you call it, <laughs> the, the, the not Hawaii US? part of the United States. <laughs> yeah, the continental US. I think I would have been 21. I lived in Vancouver for a year, and then I did a big kind of global, uh, sorry, uh, cross cross Canada, and then all around the US border, roughly like down the east coast, across the south, and up the west coast, like three or four month long trip, and I just. I just loved it. I always, I just had a deep resonance with the country and always loved, was really surprised by how diverse it was and how much more there was to it than what I had grown up seeing in movies. And then as I kept living my life and going on my entrepreneurial journey, I started coming here more and more. And that there was a really deep connection for me with that aspect of myself where you know, in this country, everybody is very optimistic and supportive and excited for you when you're doing something big and bold and brave. And it's not necessarily that way in other parts of the world. And in Australia, we have like, they call it tall poppy syndrome. Like if you kind of stick your head out too much, they just want to lop it off. So it's not really celebrated for you to be really ambitious and, and all of that. So I always, always felt a deep resonance with the US and I was just spending increasing amounts of time here and eventually decided, well, I'm going to make a plan to move. <laughs> I, th- I think that's something that we as Americans, maybe especially Americans that have moved abroad. I don't know. I'm I'm totally just throwing this out there. But like, I think we might not understand or, or value that enough about mm-hmm. like where we come from. Because when you when you grow up in the US, you're told a lot of things like you learn a lot of things like, you know, you're you're the no- it's the number one country in the world. It's the biggest economy. It's, uh, you know, and, and there mm-hmm. is this mentality that like Ricky Bobby, like if you ain't first, you're last kind of thing like you just you, yeah. you just reach for the top and you should go out you should be unique and different and try stuff and push the limits and all these things right so it's like go to the extreme and, and a lot of that runs into the business world or is if, mm-hmm. if it's not just like centered on the business world so you know you you know that or you think that but then you go abroad and maybe you learn some different things you you see some other ways of living and thinking and you go okay maybe that's not all it's cracked up to be mm-hmm. um, this was the case for me for sure like I had that yeah understanding that like okay well maybe it's just not all about just like being number one and having this giant, mm-hmm. you know, like making and a ton of money. I think that's true as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think all that's true. But I think what gets lost in that a little bit is like you stop valuing the fact that all that you just said is so attractive and so true. Mm-hmm. I, w- I had a conversation with a, a British guy recently and there's probably this like, n- it's a normal thing to think like, oh, like Americans, British, Australians, like kind of, you know, there's probably pretty similar in all these senses. But mm-hmm. this British guy was telling me he was like just talking about his business and how he was disadvantaged because he was British and most of his employees were British and he was competing directly against 
an American company that was Mm -hmm. all Americans and led by American people with just different mentality. And he goes, I was just at a total disadvantage simply because of that. And I thought that Mm -hmm. was fascinating. Like I had to dive deeper. Like, what do you mean? And he basically said a lot of what you said, like, he's like, it's just a different mentality. And he's like, over here, I'm getting kind of persecuted a little bit for trying to be such a a big shot and trying to push this business to new heights. And, you know, people want to take you down. And he's like, over there, everybody's trying to build you up. And so anyway, Mm -hmm. I don't want us to lose that. Like, I think there's a balance to be found. I think there's something special about that. Yeah. And that's the best thing about travel and and working globally and remotely is like connecting with these other ways as well. Because I spent two and a half years in the US from like end of 2019 until May this year, because I didn't leave because of what was happening. And it was the first time in my entire adult life since I was 18 that I had been in one place for two and a half years like that. It was the first time I'd been somewhere for more than 12 months and not left. And so it was very interesting experience to get very like grounded into one culture, one way of thinking, one way of being. You know, there were aspects that I became sick of. I became sick of some of that just get it every be number one like the really like aggressive and it doesn't matter what the cost is kind of thing and when I traveled down to when I first got out and (laughs) essentially and I was in Croatia for the digital nomad festival that was there and then I was down in Guatemala for volcano summit recently and then I was up in Canada but especially in like Europe and Guatemala like Oh, it was such a relief and so refreshing to see, I don't know what I would call like maybe some more organic ways of life. Like there's a lot in the US that's it's very like we've created it all. It's very built. It's very structured. Like little things like this is totally abstract, I guess, but fruit trees are growing everywhere in Guatemala and in Croatia. They're dropping their leaves and their flowers and their fruits and making the streets messy, but you can pick them and you can eat them and people do. And that's just walking down every street always. Like it's not like that in the US because we've created cities that are clean. And so we only plant the male trees that don't fruit and like these little things that are hard to notice when you're in and out, but when you're here for a long time and then you go, it's like, whoa, there's some big differences here. And, you know, I think there's some really deep flaws in in some aspects of American society where we've become very disconnected from each other. And, um, but you know, I think there's such variety here as well. And there's a lot of people that are feeling called back to the land and back to community and things like that. So that's really beautiful as well. So like you said, it's like taking all of the beauty and the gifts and then also taking those beauty and gifts from other cultures and other places and saying like what most resonates with me and how do I, how do I bring that into my being? Yeah, it's 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 finding that equilibrium between the two and, and figuring out what works for you. I mean, fortunately, there's enough opportunity in, in different places now where you can hopefully kind of pick and choose where mm-hmm. is the right place for you, what fits, you know, what you're looking for. And that's another beautiful thing about this movement. What kind of like very practically speaking, people listening to the show that might want to make the move to the US, we can look at this from a lot of different angles, but what, you know, just generally speaking, like some, some advice you might give, I mean, from a visa standpoint, from a, from like, you know, what to be, what to be aware of, like any, anything, any kind of like major two or three bullet points that that you would offer to someone that might be wanting to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, I think, and this could be said for anything and anywhere, but like, I think if you really want something, there's always a way and a possibility of, of figuring out how to get it. In terms of specifically, I'm not like in any way an expert on visas or anything like that. And and obviously depending on because of fucked up things like passport privilege, you know, depending on where you you come from, it's a lot more difficult to get visas and things. But there are there's lots of different visas. There is lots of opportunity. And so I've actually had an E2 visa, which was is like investor visa where you set up a company or or what have you and make an investment. And that was the first visa that I came on. Um, And then I ended up getting an E3 visa where I was like sponsored by one of my own companies to work here in my job. And now I'm married to an American, so I have a green card. Um, So I've been through lots of like visas and, um, you know, I, I think using the help of an immigration lawyer who's a specialist if you can afford it, and thankfully there are different options at different price points and things, I think, but can be really helpful to navigate what what's possible. 
like what are the options and what's possible because there's always possibilities. And I think now with, um, you know, there's more digital nomad visas opening up all around the world, which are awesome. So you can go and hang out in places without having to commit to this whole, I'm moving here. I need like a more permanent visa situation. And as we have work uncoupled from nation state a bit more and we're working remotely, like the governments all around the world are still trying to figure out how that's all going to work. But if you have a remote job, like, and this is definitely not legal advice, but I mean, you, there are ways to enter countries as a tourist. And I don't know if you're doing your work from there or not, like if it really actually matters. I mean, like I said, governments around the world are trying to figure out how this stuff works, but you're not taking jobs from anyone in that country, which is really the the line that we've been sold in the past of why we can't let people into places because they're going to take jobs from the people who are citizens or what have you. Um, so I don't, not sure how that line stacks up in you know, <laughs> this new world that we're entering. But nobody um, knows yet. It's a it's a no man's land of just like uh, we think we're doing it right. We're not really sure, but uh, I think we're all happy living in that gray area. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I don't want to give any like legal specific advice, but just knowing there's like so many options and I think trying not to get daunted or scared by some of the formalities around this stuff and just figuring out ways to be where you want to be and do what you want to do. I mean, there's countries that I've spent a lot of time in where it's really normal for us to like do a visa run out of the country and back in again the next day because... I mean, it, it works. Like you get issued a 30-day visa or a 90-day visa on entry. And as far as that country is concerned, you can go and, and come back. And not all countries are going to be that like loose and free with it. Everywhere is a little bit different. But get talk to people who are doing it. You know, I think that's probably the most practical advice I could give is like wherever it is that you want to be, if it is the U.S., or wherever it is, just talk to people who are living there who have been on that path, but get their contacts to their immigration lawyers, find out from them about what it's really like to navigate the border and the visa systems and all of that. Because especially during this time where we haven't traveled as much, I, I think it's opening up for most people now this year. But you know, there's probably even new layers of anxiety that didn't exist before with travel just because of having this period of not doing it for some people. And new things that you need to go different places and things, but just use the, the people who are actually out doing it are the ones that know yeah. <laughs> really what you have to do to navigate versus what it might say on the government website or what have you. Oh yeah. That stuff's like so often outdated. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It's, it's either like outdated. It's half, it's half wrong. There's something, you know, some form that's changed and yeah, you do. Or even if it's technically the law, are they actually enforcing it? Like, I mean, I, I remember when I went to Europe in May, it was my first trip out of the country and I was really nervous about all the different paperwork and tests and everything that I had to have. And I was looking up because I was having flying through a couple of countries and things. And it was like quite a lot by the time I got it all. Didn't get asked for any of it anywhere. And I was like, okay, well, that's <laughs> like this I was really stressed for nothing because, yeah, I mean, I probably, I, I got it all so that I had the right documents and things to do the things that I needed to do. But then, yeah, the irony was I, I wasn't asked for any of it anywhere. So... But only a traveler could have told me that because that's not what the websites told me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, I was just, I was just managing our, uh, our like company retreat recently with you know, like a hundred people coming from 30 something different countries and flying into Germany and then driving to Austria and like dealing with all that, all the documentation around that was mm -hmm. such a nightmare on the surface. And then like in the end, it was just like, yeah. Well, just move along, you know. Like everybody, yeah. we 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 want people back now, so I don't yeah, know. It's, exactly. Yeah, that. I mean, I I'm just like you though. Like I always recommend people. I've, I've done the visa thing in multiple countries, and tr you know, tried like living mm -hmm. in different places for long periods of time, and visa hops, and like just that's that's the time when you hire a professional. And there's people at different price mm -hmm. points, and there's a lot of like free resources too. Like I don't know if Facebook groups yeah. were ever useful for you or anything mm -hmm. but i mean oh for sure yeah 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 is there is there anyone in particular in the u.s that you would send people to um not really like no yeah. one in particular that comes to the top of my mind but i have my the immigration lawyer i use but she's just a one person you know i think just asking asking people asking in forums asking in groups googling or whatever to find out what you specifically want to find out from because it really depends where you're coming from as well like what what passport you hold and what visa you're potentially entering on like 
if you're Australian, for sure, I can probably help because I know your situation and, and I've been on it. But if you're from somewhere else, it could be totally different. So yeah, yeah, there's way too many, there's way too much nuance to the those situations. Mm-hmm. All right, well, uh, well, I'm gonna I gotta get you out of here. I know you've got like real work to do, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> let you go. I'm I'm curious. So one one last question because I love when people ask me this, and I'm curious to hear your standpoint now after living in the U.S. for a while. So people always want to know, where should I go when I'm, I'm not going to go to the New Yorks and the LAs and the Vegases? Where should I go beyond that? And I would, I would love to know what you tell people because I'm positive you've gotten that question. I mean, there's a lot outside of all of that. So that's the first thing. And you could probably make, narrow it down based on the things that you like. But I do love like the Pacific Northwest is so beautiful up in Washington and Oregon in particular, um, outside of the major cities and just getting out in nature in that area is just so freaking beautiful. For me, I love it because it's really different from Australia. I think that's why I have such an affinity to it, like very green, big, tall trees, mountains. It's just like Oh, it's so, it's so beautiful. And then, yeah, places like Austin and Denver in Colorado, they're cool. If you like the city vibe, but you want something a little bit different, those are some cool places. I also love like driving in the South, like Louisiana, Georgia, Mm. like going out to Charleston, Savannah, like that's pretty cool. These are hidden gems. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, (laughs) totally agree. I lived in Charleston for a little while, actually. And, uh, it's, it's great. yeah, these are, these are cool little towns that have like actually some uh-huh. history to them and by, by our standards at least. And, uh, they're charming for sure. I, my, my answer to that question is, I, and I'm actually exactly like you. I like the, I've been living in Valencia along the Mediterranean. It's very arid and it's beautiful and beachy, but I crave the like green mountains. And, and so like, actually that's why I'm in Germany basically is like just to spend, have spent the the summer and fall. Yeah, where you are here. down south yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's and it's it has that Pacific Northwesty vibe. But the place that I tell people that's kind of like off the beaten path that they should go to is uh is like Utah and you know the Four Corners area and all those national parks, Bryce Canyon and uh, Zion and Grand Canyon and all this in that in that area is one of those uh one of those places it's the opposite of what i say i like which is why i give all the context because it's like dry and arid and red rocks and stuff yeah. but so cool and uh and often oh, man. T- driving anywhere through colorado is just like oh mind-blowing so beautiful yeah <laughs> my introduction yeah. i mean i grew up in the u.s my whole life but i did like uh me and three friends nick ty and pete they listened to the show they might be listening right now we did a road trip across the u.s when we were in college for two and a half, three months or something. And we hit all those national parks and spent all the time on the West Coast. And I think people from other countries may not realize like, yeah, I grew up there my entire life. I spent 20 something years living there and never really went like (laughs) through 90% of it until that point. Uh, So it was just a whole nother world for me. Uh, But it's it's gorgeous out there. Well, Sarah, this was awesome. I really appreciate it. I know you're very busy and thank you for for taking the time. It was cool to hear more about your story and how you arrived here. And yeah, I just, I, I had a really good time with it. So thank you for for taking the time to share. Me too. What an awesome conversation. Thank you so much, Chase. I just love the work that you're doing in the world. So thanks for, thanks for flying the flag. Yeah, ditto for sure. Well, I, I look forward to catching up again soon and uh, I'll let you, let you get started. So Thanks. Thanks a lot. We'll, we'll speak soon. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter. No spam, guaranteed or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me, it also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.